So, um, as uh, I was, um, I tried to, to, um, con to manage my time, but uh, Filippo helped me out. Uh, so, um, I have a monster presentation for the reason I was, I was telling before to Filippo, <laughs> for the reason that uh, I tried to uh, make uh, this presentation understandable also for people that are not uh, acquainted with uh, the debate uh, that I'm talking about today, and particularly the debate on uh, uh, situated uh, cognition and uh, the debate on situated affectivity. So, this talk is, uh, um, so to say, a retrospective talk, a guide. Uh, so people that are uh, already expert in this debate may be some, somehow annoyed, but I hope uh, not too much. Um, and uh, it, I, I called it a guide for the perplexed uh, because uh, um, if you never encounter this kind of uh, topics, uh, you could be perplexed at the end, but uh, let's see what happens. Um, this is just a, a, remi a reminder of uh, my workplace in Pavia that I don't, uh, um, I don't see uh, since, uh, since many time now because of the coronavirus. It is just to, to, re to remind us that we have uh, workplaces and sometimes uh, even beautiful workplaces like uh, like the seat of uh, Broletto, Palazzo del Broletto in Pavia. And uh, hopefully we will see uh, sometime in the future in this, uh, in this context. Um, just a brief presentation of my research interests. Uh, I work uh, in philosophy of mind and cognitive science. I have also worked in my PhD in philosophy of language. And uh, um, in the last years, I uh, mainly mm, dealt, have dealt with uh, um, the debate on extended mind and situated cognition. And uh, in the last two years, I began to, um, to um, research, uh, to do some research in the uh, domain of uh, situated affectivity and so in, in philosophy of emotions also. Um, so the aims of uh, today's talk are, are uh, two. Uh, the first one will take most of the, most of the time. This is, this is to introduce situated affectivity, in particular some versions of, uh, um, of situated affectivity that I found uh, most interesting. And um, starting from the presentation of uh, situated cognition, uh, so showing the connection between uh, uh, these two uh, domain, at least uh, from an historical point of view, not, not, not necessarily from a theoretical point of view, because I think that uh, uh, in principle they, that could be considered as two independent, uh, independent theses. Um, the last part of the talk, uh, the very last part of the talk is on a very controversial topic that I find um, interesting and uh, uh, unsettled in the, in the debate of extended mind, which is the topic of extended consciousness. And um, the reason why I put this, put this second point in my talk is that um, making some research in, uh, uh, in the domain of situated affectivity, I found that uh, some versions of situated affectivity are also interesting for uh, giving some uh, um, some new hints on the debate of uh, uh, on situ on um, extended consciousness. Sorry, um, but this is a very um, experimental part, the last part. So maybe I I will not uh, tell you say, tell you something very uh, very well built, um, and I apologize uh, uh, now for that. So the plan of the talk is. Uh, divided into four sections. We have the first section in which I will uh, guide you from situated cognition to uh, situated affectivity. The second section is uh, dedicated to uh, a variety of situated affectivity, namely scaffolded affectivity. The, the third section is dedicated to another variety of uh, situated affectivity uh, that is extended affectivity. 
And the last section, uh, which is uh, uh, called uh, Into the Wild, <laughs> tries to uh, make this connection between uh, some version of situated affectivity, namely extended affectivity, and the topic of extended consciousness. So let's, uh, let's start by uh, presenting uh, uh, the passage uh, from situated cognition to situated affectivity. I will give you the credit of these images at the end of the presentation, otherwise I will go in jail. Um, <laughs> so, as you know, as you probably know, um, in the last 50 years or so, there has been a change in the way um, cognition has been conceived. Uh, we um, have a passage from the so-called classical cognitive science developed from the 50s to the 80s to the new cognitive science, which is also called the 4E cognitive science or cognition uh, that refers to embodied, embedded, extended, and enacted cognition. Or another way to call it is uh, to refer to this uh, general term of situated cognition. Uh, something similar is happening or um, have happened already in the domain of uh, the philosophical study of emotions and affective states. And so that's why we talk about situated affectivity. These are two uh, important uh, uh, papers that uh, introduce th this, um, uh, this, um, this label, uh, particularly the paper in 2013. Um, and so uh, what I will do in the first part uh, of, uh, uh, this, um, of this talk is to present briefly uh, some, variety of, uh, some varieties of uh, situated cognition. And then from these varieties, I will show the connection to uh, the correspondent varieties of situated affectivity. Um, as for situated cognition, we can say that uh, um, with the words of uh, Robert Rupert, there has been a paradigm shift um, and uh, according to which the um, cognitive processes are not anymore uh, conceived as uh, the uh, result of uh, uh, computations on representation performed by uh, the human mind as a software rather as an emergent activity of a larger, more encompassing system as the product of the brain, body, and environment working together. And uh, I uh, would like to specify that in my view, I, I, am, I agree with the, with the Robbins and Ididi, according to which um, situated, situated cognition has to be understood as a general term that uh, um, includes in, uh, in its uh, specifications uh, uh, the uh, several uh, uh, versions that are, that are uh, written here, so embodied and active, embedded and distributed cognition. Uh, of course, there is also extended cognition, which is not mentioned here, but uh, um, um, I will not go into the uh, description and explanation of all these versions, otherwise we will uh, take uh, not one hour, but rather uh, some hours more. Um, here are some images of uh, some famous examples uh, um, that have been used to argue for situated cognition. We have the case of uh, this uh, game Scrabble, in which um, uh, it has been emphasized uh, um, the fact that we uh, tend to interact with the environment and uh, um, offload the operations of uh, moving the tiles on our tray in order to find new patterns and so new words. Um, this is opposed to the possibility of uh, uh, performing these operations uh, uh, inside our brain, so to say. And the same is uh, true of uh, the Tetris example, in which uh, we uh, we avoid to perform mental rotation uh, for, this, for the reason that it is very demanding for our uh, brain and uh, cognitive processes. Rather, we prefer to uh, 
perform a physical rotation by pressing the button on our, key, on our keyboards. And uh, these kind of actions have been called uh, epistemic action precisely for this reason, because they are actions that are not the result of a decision making process. They are, so, so to say, part of this decision making process. Um, here um, we have uh, two very important technological devices in our everyday life a smartphone and a computer. Uh, Thanks to these, uh, to these devices, we offload uh, so many tasks that we uh, avoid to uh, perform in our mind. That is, it is, not, it is uh, almost unuseful to, to list some of these tasks because we already, we already uh, know them uh, very well. Um, just to make an example, we offload the navigation task by using a smartphone, for example, and we store so many memories in our computer by means of pictures or texts. And uh, to make just an example of our work of academics, uh, uh, it would be impossible without the memory that we have uh, in our uh, computers. The last image uh, um, represents um, a, a beaver who builds, uh, uh, who typically builds uh, dams. And uh, this is referred to uh, a version of situated cognition that uh, um, has to do with the, uh, with the niche construction theory and the, precisely the uh, so-called scaffolded cognition. So the idea is that uh, um, while in the case of uh, extended cognition, we have uh, the environment and the external resource we, that uh, um, co-constitute the uh, cognitive uh, process or mental state. In the case of scaffolded cognition, we don't have this uh, uh, demanding metaphysical thesis. We just observe that uh, we humans and also evolved creatures in general are used to uh, personalize, engineer our environments in order to uh, improve our lives, basically. Um, so um, another way to say, uh, to say that is to refer to the principle of cognitive economy uh, expressed uh, in this case by Andy Clark. In general, evolved creatures will neither store nor process information in costly ways when they can use the structure of the environment and their operations upon it as a convenient stand-in for the information processing operations concerned. That is, know only as much as you need to know to get the job done. Um, so uh, to sum up, cognition uh, according um, to this uh, new paradigm of situated cognition has been described as distributed embedded, embodied, enacted, extended, and scaffolded, precisely for the reason of uh, uh, the use of environmental resources like cognitive artifacts, uh, other social agents in some cases, and uh, uh, symbolic system in general, so language or mathematical systems, for example. Um, in this presentation, I will only uh, refer to the extended and scaffolded cases, and I will uh, um, dedicate the last part of this section to the explanation of the difference between, uh, between these two um, perspectives. Um, so on one side, we have the so-called extended model of the mind or cognition. And on the other side, we have the scaffolded model um, put forward by uh, Kim Serenli famously, and then uh, uh, also by Joel Kruger and uh, Giovanna Colombetti in the case of emotions, but we will see that in a moment. Uh, so according to the extended uh, model, we have this uh, uh, strong metaphysical thesis according to which uh, the boundaries of cognitive systems lie outside the envelope on, of individual organisms, in some cases, of course, not always. Um, and so the cognitive activity is distributed across individuals and situations. And uh, so the, there is this uh, uh, thesis of literal extension of uh, uh, our cognitive and mental processes and states. 
uh, how do we gain this extension? We have two ways of gaining it. Traditionally, there have been, uh, uh, there have been two ways. Uh, the first way is by considerations of parity. And the second way is by consideration of complementarity or integration, or somehow, sometimes uh, this principle is called uh, uh, integration by complementarity, just to, <laughs> to sum uh, these two very important principles. Uh, the parity principle is uh, expressed by, um, is part of the uh, project, uh, original project by Clark and Chalmers of, the, of proposing the extended mind in uh, their 1998 article. Um, it is very uh, bad expressed, actually, the parity principle, but uh, the, 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 the concept is that if a part of the world functions uh, as a process uh, which uh, we would have no hesitation in recognizing as part of the cognitive process, um, if it were done in the head, uh, then that part of the world is part of the cognitive processes. So that if there is a sufficient functional um, analogy between uh, um, the process that is done in the head and the process that is done through an external resources that then uh, we can uh, consider the, um, the process performed by the agent as an extended process through the use of the external resource. The famous example that I will um, introduce for the, for the one of you that uh, don't know it, if there is a someone that uh, that's, mm, doesn't know this, uh, this example, but I assume that not anyone uh, is acquainted with this uh, kind of debate, uh, refers to uh, two fictional characters, Otto and Inga. Um, Inga has a normally functioning uh, biological memory while Otto suffers from Alzheimer, Alzheimer, Alzheimer disease. And uh, so um, while Inga refers to her biological memory when she, when she needs uh, some information, uh, Otto um, always carries a notebook around with him uh, for the reason that uh, uh, in this notebook, he writes down every information he may need. And so um, In this scenario, uh, what Clark and Chalmers argue for is that uh, um, at a certain point in time, we could attribute to Inga and to Otto the same dispositional belief. Uh, the, uh, the only difference between these two beliefs is the vehicle by which it is realized. In the case of Inga, it is realized by some biological substrate while in the case of Otto, it is realized by the physical symbols on the notebook. And this is precisely the, uh, the idea of uh, extended mind uh, in the form of the uh, vehicular externalism uh, as presented by Clark and Chalmers. Um, of course, there are restrictions uh, uh, for these cases to be uh, plausible cases of extended mind. So they, uh, they present some uh, criteria for a reasonable extension of the mind. These are the four criteria. I would not uh, uh, discuss the criteria because otherwise this talk would be on uh, extended cognition and not on situated affectivity. But of course, if you have questions on that, uh, I, will, uh, I will try to answer. Um, so there are restrictions uh, for uh, the cases that are good cases of extension, of course, and uh, it is not so easy actually to find uh, uh, the right criteria to, uh, to determine uh, the, uh, the plausible cases of extension, and this is part of the, of the debate. Um, the second way uh, through which we can gain uh, um, extension is by uh, consideration of, uh, of uh, integration and complementarity. And this way is uh, put forward by Richard Menari and John Sutton in particular. In these cases, we don't have 
a functional analysis, analogy between uh, uh, the internal resource and the external one. Rather, we have a complementarity or an integration so uh, strict that uh, um, it is uh, legitimate to think to the process that we are um, uh, we are considering as uh, a, a unified cognitive process. Um, so an example of, uh, of complementarity is the use of sketches in the creative process that would not be possible to, uh, to do sketches on, the, on, the, on paper. It's not possible to do that uh, on, uh, in our head, uh, or at least par just partially. So it is a case in which the external resource complement um, and integrate the, uh, the um, mental capacities, the, the, the inner mind's capacities. Um, so just to be clear, because this is this is will be useful in the discussion of uh, of situated affectivity. Um, in in general, uh, we can say that extended mind has two targets. On the one hand, we have uh, the um, dispositional states, like the one like the one in the example of uh, Otto and Inga. Um, in the other hand, on the other hand, we have uh, also um, cases of extension that concern temporary fleeting or current cognitive processes, such as cal calculating a, a complex sum. Um, and the, um, the consideration that we use, the argument that we use in order to, uh, to argue for these two points uh, are different. On the one hand, we have uh, uh, the classically the to thought experiment of Otto and Inga. And uh, while in the, on the other hand, for the second point, we have considerations of coupling and self-stimulating loops. Coupling is the relation between two, uh, two systems or two parts of, part of a system in which one part uh, influences the other uh, and uh, uh, vice versa. In a very in a very uh, strict strict way, so there is a, there is this uh, this loop, this continuous interaction between the two parts. Um, and of course, these second kind of states are the ones that are interesting for the reason for uh, uh, reflecting on consciousness. Because if you if you if we talk about dispositional states, well, dispositional states are typically not conscious, so. It is not. Uh, uh, it is not there that we would uh, search for some uh, um, some hints on the topic of uh, of extended consciousness. While this the second case is much more problematic, also in the uh, in the uh, in the classical debate of extended mind on extended mind, and it has been pointed out that uh, it could be not so easy to. Um, to um, argue for this kind of states are as extended without uh, uh, conceding any possibility of extended uh, uh, of extended uh, some part of our consciousness. But I will I will come back to this uh, to this point. So um, for now we have seen the. Um, version of uh, situated cognition that we may call extended cognition. Now we will briefly see um, the uh, other kind of, uh, of, of uh, the other version uh, that is interesting for our, uh, for my talk, uh, which is scaffolded cognition. I was, I have already said that uh, it is uh, uh, based on the use of, on the extension of uh, uh, niche construction theory in the case of uh, uh, human cognition. Uh, of course, this implies that uh, uh, niches, which are typically biological niches in, in niche construction theory, um, are, are, can be possible uh, cognitive niches, social niches, cultural niches, and so on. Um, and the author that uh, uh, famously put forward this idea was uh, Kim Serenli in a paper and then in some books. Uh, according to Sterenli, um, 
human competencies depend in intimately on the environment being scaffolded to support adaptive decision making and humans engineer their environment to support their activities. Uh, so, as you see, these are very, um, these are lighter theses uh, from a metaphysical point of view. So, one could be tempted to accept this thesis uh, and not the extended ones. Uh, the interesting thing is that uh, um, Serenli himself uh, uh, thinks that uh, um, this perspective is uh, somehow more powerful because it uh, includes the extended cases. And so he doesn't uh, uh, think that it is impossible to have case of, cases of extension. He just thinks that uh, um, the, um, the extended cases are special cases of uh, scaffolding. Uh, cases in which the, um, those criteria expressed by uh, Clark and Chalmers uh, uh, are, are, are satisfied. And so uh, it is possible to uh, have a cohabitation of uh, scaffolded cognition and extended cognition. Um, so the difference basically between these two uh, perspectives is uh, um, uh, is that uh, on the uh, scaffolding view, uh, there is just a contribution uh, and an environmental support essential for maintaining the character and functional integrity of the process in question, while in the extended cases, we have uh, a, an external resource that is part of the cognitive process itself. So this is, this is the distinction that we, we will also find in the cases of, uh, of situating affectivity. Just some words on affectivity, some very general words. Um, um, affectivity is used as a general term that typically refers to several affective phenomena like the ones that are listed here. So uh, we have emotions, temperaments, moods, uh, sentiments, character traits. And as you, as you see, uh, some of these states are typically occurrence states. Um, while others are, uh, or, or they can be occurrent or dispositional states. In the case of emotions, for example, we, have, we can have cases of uh, an occurrent emotion. I am uh, angry at someone uh, for some reason in this precise moment, uh, but I can also be angry uh, as a disposition. So I'm not, I'm not angry now, it's just that I have this anger some, somehow in my, um, somewhere in my uh, mind, and uh, uh, it is just a disposition. If I see the person to whom I, at whom I am angry, uh, this uh, disposition will become uh, an occurrence state, but uh, it could be possible to have uh, both cases. And uh, of course, this is uh, some, something analogous to the case of, uh, of cognition that we've uh, uh, just uh, seen. So, um, affective states have typically some aspects, so we can talk about the bodily component, the feeling, uh, or the experiential, uh, um, uh, the experiential côté of uh, having uh, an effect, being an, in an affective state. We can have, we can, we also have a cognitive evaluative component uh, that has to do with the fact that. Uh, uh, having uh, an emotion, for example, is somehow to judge a, situation, a certain situation in a certain way, and this is the, uh, the, more, uh, the most cognitive uh, uh, aspect of, uh, of uh, affective states, the one that uh, is, uh, of course, emphasized by cognitivist, uh, cognitivist theories of emotion. And we also have a motivational component. So the, the uh, typical tendency to, to act, to action that, uh, that is uh, connected with, uh, with experiencing uh, an affective state. Um, so um, I adapted uh, to, give, to give you a, a, a possible definition of what uh, situated affectivity is. I adapted a definition by uh, Stefan Walter and Wilutsky um, of uh, situated cognition, but I think that it might work. 
Um, so affectivity is situated would mean that it is dependent upon or co-constituted by the body, the environment and or the embodied interaction with it. And uh, as you may see, um, this, in this case, uh, when we speak about dependency, uh, dependence, um, we have uh, the case of scaffolded affectivity, or uh, we have seen it for, for cognition, but uh, we can uh, make now a passage to, to affectivity. Uh, in the case uh, uh, when we speak about co-constitution, uh, on the other hand, we have uh, uh, the, uh, we, we refer to cases of extension, and um, and this is exactly the right the the the, sh the schema, so to say, the pattern that uh, we can use uh, in order to uh, to make uh, a, a guide or a, a map of what happens in uh, in uh, in the in the debate of situated affectivity. So we will have uh, uh, examples of uh, scaffolded affectivity and we will have example of uh, extended affectivity. Um, in the case of uh, scaffolded affectivity, a very, important, uh, um, a very important contribution was the one by Griffiths and Scarantino in uh, the handbook on situated cognition uh, edited by uh, Robinson and Aididi in which, uh, which was called Emotions in the Wild, um, um, that expressed very well what, what they had in mind, uh, and of course recalls the uh, title of, uh, of Cognition in the Wild by, by Hutchins. Uh, they emphasized in this uh, contribution the uh, fact that emotions are not only uh, to be considered as, uh, as responses uh, uh, and manifestation, natural manifestations of some, uh, of some inner states, uh, rather they uh, should also be considered as, um, as a socially situated uh, uh, phenomena. So um, emotions should be considered as social signals, uh, like strategic moves designed uh, to influence the behavior of other organisms, um, and uh, in this sense, they are um, they are scaffolded by the environment, uh, both from a synchronic point of view. So during an emotional episode, uh, we can use uh, some uh, uh, some external resource in order to um, to scaffold, to support, to inf and to be influenced by uh, by um, by it. Um, and also diachronically in the development of our uh, emotional repertoire. So um, um, they also uh, um, pointed out that uh, uh, emotion should be considered as uh, um, emotional episodes in particular should be considered as dynamical uh, episodes that are uh, that unfolds in time. And this is also important for uh, for considerations of uh, of what an emotion is. What what does it mean to be in an affective state? State. So um, emotions are not only responses to how things are; they are also effective goal-oriented responses. Uh, we can uh, um, use our emotional responses or emotional expression in order to manipulate for example, a certain situation in order to obtain something more in a, in a, in a negotiation with, the, with, another, um, with another person. Uh, so for example, anger is uh, not only a response to having been wronged, but also a strategy to obtain restitution. And uh, uh, the same is, uh, can be true for uh, uh, sulking in a, in a fight with, uh, with, some, uh, with some person that we know. Um, and um, of course, the cases of the audience effect, the cases in which uh, our emotional response uh, is modulated by the fact that we have or we, not, we don't have an audience and which kind of audience do we have um, is also a good case uh, uh, that uh, manifests this, uh, this feature of, uh, of emotions. 
um, the uh, work by Griffith and Scarantino was then uh, um, taken by uh, Colombetti and Kruger that put together this work with the work by Kim Sorelli on, uh, on the scaffolded mind, the scaffolded view of the mind. And so Colombetti Kruger said, okay, why don't we uh, apply the scaffolded perspective on the mind also to the cases of, uh, to the case of affectivity? Basically, this was uh, their, their, their line of argument. Um, and so they uh, emphasized uh, the um, active uh, uh, part of the agent in uh, choosing uh, uh, and personalizing uh, uh, her affective niches, for example. So um, they analyzed uh, uh, from the um, putting together many disciplines, uh, many, many hints for many disciplines, um, the way in which uh, uh, we as agents engineer our affective environments, and they proposed this, uh, um, this classification. Um, this classification of affective scaffolds in according to which we have uh, a material kind of scaffoldings. Um, for example, portable technology for listening to music or a mus musical instrument itself, uh, clothes, colors, textures and handbags. And also uh, these um, kind of examples are somewhat uh, more controversial maybe, uh, they consider as material scaffolding also environments like cinemas, concert halls, art galleries and nature, nature itself. Uh, because they say, they, what they say is that we uh, use this kind of environment in order to, to regulate, to, uh, to manage our affective life. Uh, there are also um, interpersonal scaffolds of affectivity, so they, they, this uh, notion of uh, affective scaffolding applies also to, uh, to persons, uh, to social agents, so um, in their view we use uh, the company of family, friends, uh, um, or specific groups, uh, also colleagues, for example, um, in order to, um, to manage our affective life. So we uh, could uh, uh, know that uh, if we call a certain friend, we will uh, feel in a certain way. And so this is why we, uh, we always called him, call him when we are sad, for example, or, or um, some, some, something like that. Um, these two... Um, these two classes can, uh, uh, can be mixed in, uh, when we have uh, um, material scaffolds that are uh, shared by several people. Uh, and so they, they, they find this uh, interesting example of a religious and spiritual context in which uh, the same material scaffold is uh, uh, symbolic, is important, is a... Uh, is, uh, um, has uh, an affective role for many people, like if, you, if we think to any kind of religion, we, it is easy to find many examples of this kind. Um, what is interesting is also that they, uh, they apply the uh, dimensions according, along which uh, uh, were um, um, organized uh, the uh, cases of uh, cognitive scaffolding to uh, the case of affective scaffolding. So the dimension according to which uh, uh, the relation between uh, the agent and the affective scaffold varies uh, are um, trust, individualization, and the, the fact that they are shared or not, so they are collective or not. Um, Starting from, uh, from this kind of uh, reflections, uh, um, I tried to contribute to this debate by proposing uh, an analogy, um, by proposing a notion, a, a more specific notion uh, in comparison, uh, compared with affective scaffoldings, which is the one of affective artifacts. 
And this is, uh, this is because I came from uh, the study of situated cognition. So I was uh, familiar with the uh, study of, of, of cognitive artifacts. And, uh, and I just thought that it would be a, go a good idea to apply the same, uh, uh, an analogous notion to the case of uh, affectivity. Because I think that there are some objects in this case, uh, uh, of course, we have to exclude uh, um, other persons because uh, it could be it would be metaphysically strange to, to consider a person an artifact. So, in this sense, it is a more uh, limited notion compared with uh, the one of affective scaffolds. Uh, but um, I think that uh, some features that are interesting uh, uh, for characterizing affective artifacts are the fact that they have the capacity to alter the affective condition of an agent. This is uh, an attempt to give a definition, even if it's, it, it, is, uh, um, it is pretty broad, uh, thus contributing to her affective life. Um, I think that another um, important feature is uh, um, that these objects are typically perceived as important for one sense of self. So they are also, um, I think, um, used in order to uh, pinpoint our narrative identity, for example. And uh, we certainly have in mind some objects in our uh, personal history that uh, has uh, uh, had uh, a, an important role in our uh, in our infancy, for example, or uh, in our um, uh, adult life, also. Um, and many many uh, examples are, are typically uh, cases of personal objects like uh, teddy bears, uh, family jewelry. Uh, lucky charms or souvenirs, uh, of course, these are all uh, uh, connected to, um, to memory, to, to memory, to, to the construction of our nar narrative identity. And I think that this is, a, this is really an interesting point of, uh, of this kind of uh, research. Um, so this was uh, the presentation of uh, the scaffolded version of, uh, um, of situated affectivity. But um, as I told you, oh, okay, just uh, look at the time. Um, there are also other theses that are more, um, um, more demanding, so to say, more. Um, more um, stronger uh, that uh, uh, refers to the possibility of uh, extending uh, affectivity and not only uh, of uh, scaffolding it. Uh, again, Colombetti, who is a very uh, prolific author in this, uh, in this domain, uh, and Tom Roberts uh, um, defended the idea according to which it is possible to um, apply the same uh, basically the same arguments that were used by, um, by Clark and Chalmers uh, to uh, defend uh, the idea of extended mind to the case of affectivity. And so they uh, came up with this uh, hypothesis of extended affectivity that applies uh, like, uh, like extended mind, like extended cognition applies uh, uh, to dispositional and to occurrent states. Um, of course, uh, um, what is uh, extended uh, is uh, the material underpinnings of these affective phenomena, like in the case of, uh, of extended cognition. And um, so in the case of affective disposition, we uh, would have uh, a physical basis which is distributed across both organism and environment. Um, or in the case of current affective states, current affective processes, uh, uh, we, we will have recognizably a current affective processes that are driven and boosted by subject self-stimulating loops of interaction with worldly materials. So the, uh, the arguments are exactly uh, parallel to the cases of, uh, to the case of cognition. And uh, they, um, they, they give uh, 
examples of uh, how it is possible to, to extend affective dispositions on, on, uh, on one hand and the current affective states on the other. We will see some of these examples. Um, in the case of affective disposition, which is probably the less controversial case, we will have uh, um, dispositions that are realized by uh, the use of some external resources. Like in the case of uh, Otto and Inga, Otto and his notebook, we have uh, a fictional character, uh, Eve, uh, who has a dispositional resentment at her parents, uh, which is partially realized by um, her diary, in which she writes down uh, every, every episode uh, of uh, frustration uh, with, with her parents and so on. Uh, we would we could have also cases of um, extended sentiments uh, um, if we think to uh, wedding wedding rings uh, and uh, jewels and clothes so for example of a deceased loved one that are kept uh, exactly for um, maintaining this sentiment alive so to say uh, and we also have the uh, case of uh, Rainier, uh, who is uh, a guy that uh, who, who tries to change his temperaments or his character traits, uh, also by using uh, a notebook uh, in which he um, writes down some motivational and inspirational sentences, for example, or uh, to uh, try to, 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 be, to, be, to become a meticulous person. Um, and uh, of course, uh, as, I, as I see from some faces, uh, some of your faces, uh, I, I, I bet that you are a bit perplexed and this is why, <laughs> this is the reason of my title. But uh, the idea of um, Columbetti and Roberts is uh, that um, uh, if we accept these arguments for cognition, that's the reason, then there is no reason why we shouldn't uh, accept them for, uh, for the affective uh, domain. Of course, it is debatable uh, if, if it, it is possible also to refuse the arguments uh, in the domain of, uh, of cognition. And so we, we, sh we should have no constraint in accepting them for, for affectivity. But, uh, um, actually, the uh, most controversial cases are the one of uh, uh, extended or current affective states or, or current affective components, because in this case, uh, we, uh, would we will analyze uh, every single component of, uh, of uh, for example, an emotion and see if uh, whether it could be extended. Well, Let's begin by the easy part. In the case of appraisals, which are typically the um, uh, state, the, the component of emotions that has have to do with uh, with the cognitive and evaluative uh, uh, function of an of an emotion, uh, um, being uh, basically cognitive episodes, they can be easily extended if one accepts extended cognition, of course. And this is the uh, reasoning of uh, Colombetti and Roberts and also of uh, Carter and Palermo in, uh, in their paper. Uh, for bodily components uh, of emotion, uh, um, what they say, and uh, I tend to agree, is that uh, um, if it is possible to externalize uh, to realize artificially in an, in an, an artificial substrate some functions uh, uh, like, for example, regulating the heart rate or uh, the release of some hormone. So functions that are normally um, performed by our bodily uh, parts, um, then it could be, it can, it can be in principle possible to, to uh, consider this, uh, this extension of uh, the bodily components of emotion possible. And actually it is already, uh, it is already uh, done. 
uh, of course, the most controversial case uh, is the one of uh, uh, the extension of qualitative character of, uh, of emotion. So the uh, feeling, uh, feeling uh, part of, uh, of uh, affective states. And, um, and this has to do with the problem of, uh, of extended consciousness. Um, Columbetti and Roberts are uh, rather cautious in their article. Uh, they summarize uh, the position by Clark and Chalmers about conscious, about extended consciousness. Uh, that, and Clark and Chalmers are, um, are basically against the possibility of extending uh, consciousness to. Um, and um, even if there, there have been uh, much work uh, uh, that criticized the, the, their, um, their resistance to extend consciousness. Um, what Columbetti and Robert say is that... Uh, sorry. Uh, yeah. can, I, can I, sorry, can I interrupt you to, to, can you explain briefly what extended consciousness is supposed to be? Even, because yeah, I'm not familiar. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Of course, um, but the idea is that uh, um, extended cognition is uh, um, a thesis of, uh, that regards, uh, that concerns the uh, extension of uh, the material vehicles of cognition, right? So, um, of course, some cognitive states are conscious and some are not. And typically extended cognition concerns uh, unconscious states like uh, in, their, in, in, in uh, Clark and Chalmers' idea. Uh, unconscious states are, for example, uh, the dispositional states, that is the typical example, but also in their view, and this is the, the, the most problematic part, uh, also uh, cases like the one of Tetris. Okay, this is, this is a case, this is a, for them is a typical case of, uh, uh, of extended cognition that, uh, uh, doesn't have to do with consciousness. Well, um, and they say, okay, now consciousness is an internal process um, and it is not possible uh, to, uh, to, to extend it. This means that it is not possible that the material vehicles of consciousness are extended. So they, they imply, they include some parts of the external world. The reasons why they do that uh, um, are clear from, from a certain point of view, because uh, to say that uh, uh, also our conscious states are extended is a pretty um, strong thesis. And uh, in, in their view, uh, in, in the view of Chalmers uh, for sure, but also in the view of, Cla of Andy Clark, uh, we have good reason not to go for this uh, on this road, but um, and they 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 wrote some uh, some pieces on uh, in in trying to defend this uh, this view that it would would not be the case to to apply the same arguments also to to conscious states, uh, but uh, there is a. Uh, there is some literature according to which uh, this uh, defense uh, is not so strong. So um, that the arguments that they use uh, are not so strong and they, they, they don't, uh, um, they don't, uh, um, they are not, they are not uh, um, enough to resist the possibility of extended consciousness. And um, but yeah, so I will I will go to my uh, last uh, slide so that uh, we can also make the the, the pause and then go for the Q and A. Uh, oh, the last the last <laughs> sorry the last example of situated affectivity that I wanted to to mention that has to do with uh, with extended consciousness is the the position by uh, Jan Slaby. Um, he, um, he proposes a version of, uh, of extended affectivity that uh, uh, goes in the direction of uh, the integration part of the extended uh, 
version uh, which is close to an activism that I will not uh, uh, discuss here because it is a, a, a too big, uh, too big issue. Uh, and um, I find I, I think that it is interesting this uh, notion that he proposes of phenomenal coupling, which would be a phenom a, a coupling. So we we already said what coupling is that has to do with the phenomenal and qualitative part of, uh, of uh, the emotional experience. So in his view, um, um, phenomenal coupling can be, uh, can be defined as uh, a part of the process dynamics of emotion uh, can both originate and also be dynamically sustained and driven along by processing is in the environment of the emoting person as when one is moved to tears by a sad movie or pulled into anger and even active aggression by being under the sway of a fierce crowd. So um, basically what he wants to say is that uh, um, if we uh, accept the, uh, or, so, or so I understand it, um, if we accept the possibility that uh, also occurrent processes can be uh, can be extended uh, in the as in the case of cognition and and in the case of uh, of emotions, we can have uh, this uh, um, this analysis according to which there is one process that uh, um, combine the uh, the um, features of the agent and of the external resources, particularly when the uh, external resource, for example, have has expressive qualities, like in the case of a uh, work of art or something like that. So I think that this quotation is also very interesting. Phenomenal coupling is the direct online engagement of an agent's affectivity with an environmental structure or process that itself manifests affect-like expressive qualities be it in the form of an affective atmosphere or as a dynamic gestalt feature of a different kind, such as an expressive quality of a piece of music. And so, um, yeah, the idea is that we cannot account for this uh, full phenomenal quality without uh, um, without including in the uh, process uh, also the uh, features of the um, extended, the external resource, which in this case could be um, another fellow humans or uh, a piece of art uh, or uh, dance or theater and so on. And uh, so my last point uh, is uh, about these uh, doubts uh, on the possibility of uh, um, resist to this kind of extension once, once that we have accepted uh, extended cognition, for example. Of course, this, uh, this uh, last part does not concern a scaffolded cognition, which, is, uh, which uh, we have seen it is another uh, kind of uh, thesis. So, um, I, I will just read these two uh, last slides. According to Clark and Chalmers, extended cognition and mind do not affect conscious states, and the, the thing that I was uh, saying to Filippo. Consciousness remains internal to the boundary of the individual for reason of bandwidth, direct access, and in general for lack of compelling, of compelling arguments. These are some of the aspects that they, are, they, they used uh, in order to uh, resist to extended consciousness. Well, recently, this resistance to extended consciousness has been criticized by many authors from different points of view. From parity consideration, there is this nice paper by Karina Wald, predictive processing, uh, sensory motor accounts of cognition, and also from an internalist point of view. This is a very interesting uh, uh, paper by Katalin Farkas on this uh, topic. Um, in trying to resist extended consciousness, the most controversial cases of extension are the ones concerning or current cognitive states, like the example of Tetris. These, can, these cases concern or current processes that can have a conscious aspect, like in the case of perceptual experience, for example. Uh, in the case of Tetris, we have 
a perceptual uh, process. It is not easy to accept them as cases of extended or current cognitive processes without admitting that even the conscious past part might, might be extended. Um, I think, and this is the, the last, uh, last um, part, that the study of whether and how affective states may, may extend is another case in point, as many affective states are current states. And so the view of extended emotions, especially the notion of phenomenal coupling by Jan Slaby, opens the door to extended consciousness by reconnecting the debate on extended mind with the one on situated affectivity. So this is uh, a, the map of the positions that we, uh, that we saw. Actually, they are not, uh, we discussed, we didn't discuss the cognitivist flavor of extended affectivity and uh, many enacted uh, proposals uh, uh, and not even the socially extended versions, but as you see, uh, there were a lot uh, to say, <laughs> a lot of things to say already in the, in the scaffolded and extended view. So that would be all for me, from me. Thank you very much.